everyone. Welcome to the premiere of my new project about Villa de Rosa, Way of the Cross. And I know that uh, some of you have been to Jerusalem, many of you have been actually several times. And yes, I know that some of you have done the Via de la Rosa. Uh, I, it was a pilgrimage for some of you, for some of you it was just uh, all just a uh, general uh, tour. Um, but today, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm not going to be preaching. I'm not going to be um well, talking about uh, well, Christian values, I'm not going to talk about Jesus and his suffering uh, in, well, in the sense of preaching. Uh, no, we are going to look at Via de la Rosa as, um, well, as a tourist attraction on the one hand and as a very interesting historical phenomenon and some interest in archaeology and architecture um, behind it, under it, really, literally, like under it. That's what we are going to do. Hi, Cindy. Good to see you, dear. How are you feeling today? So it's time to begin. Uh, local time is 6 p.m., so we are to begin. Uh, I see some new names here as well, so just uh, allow me one minute to introduce myself properly. My name is Anna, and I'm originally from St. Petersburg, Russia. I'm a licensed tour guide to St. Petersburg because of the war Russian-Ukrainian war uh, I relocated to Israel last year. Right now I'm studying to be a licensed tour guide to Israel. I'm halfway through um, and uh, I'm just, I just feel super lucky that I am already able to take you to some sites, to share with you some stories. And of course, every of my tour, uh, it's well, it's been heavily researched. You know, I always spend hours, hours and hours and days for researching. And of course, uh, I attend lectures and study tours. So it's, you know, it's like um, I feel even more responsibility um, because I'm only learning. And um, so that's why I try even harder <laughs> to, to take you to these locations, be it a, an actual tour, because I have done quite a lot of tours around Israel, actually from the sites, um, but uh, also some of the locations just do not provide any connectivity. And this is the case with Via de la Rosa, because Via de la Rosa is located in the old city. And uh, well, when they built the old city, the, you know, the, they couldn't have foreseen, you know, the internet issues, also the parking issues, uh, the transport, all of this is, yeah, you will see it in the video, by the way, you will see the struggles of the, of the old city and how it resists the progress. <laughs> it is true. Maybe th th this is what makes also the old city that special. Jerusalem's old city. So uh, the video is pre-recorded. I will be uh, disabling the chat as I share the screen for about half an hour. Then I will uh, put the video on pause. We'll have a Q&A and uh, then the second half of the tour and the Q&A afterwards. Again, it's totally fine. Your cameras are off, your microphones are off. We do it just for the comfort of everyone on the tour. And uh, uh, here is, I would like to share with you a link because Via de la Rosa is a quite a long route. Uh, it has 14 stations. And uh, I should tell you that I honestly have no idea how many parts uh, it's going to take us. Of course, I have all the content ready, but depending on the dynamics of the tour, also your questions. So I really can't really say how many episodes they're going to be all together, but I'll be running them every Saturday. The next episode is already scheduled and I shared it with you in the links. So the next uh, next Saturday, July 8th, the second episode of Via de la Rosa. Also tonight is going to be one more tour. Uh, I know the geography is absolutely crazy here. In, in less than an hour from this tour, I will be taking you to a White Nights River uh, cruise of St. Petersburg. I cannot be there myself now due to many reasons, political mostly, but... It's always nice to be able to travel just virtually with you and share those moments together again. Sometimes, actually, I will be taking you on this tour to very dark places. I actually included some locations that are not uh, included in Via de la Rosa, but they are on the way and they have 
relevance, they have significance to the subject. So sometimes I will be taking you underground, uh, many, many uh, meters deep underground to some tunnels and cisterns. I mean, all of this is related to, um, to the topic of Via Dolorosa. So Via Dolorosa, way of the cross, way of suffering, right? This, uh, this is a historical route uh, to, well, to show, to retrace the, uh, the way that Jesus, um, um, well, might have taken uh, and uh, partially it looks like it definitely the route uh, to retrace this very, very last um, uh, hours of life of Jesus before crucifixion. Uh, that is why Via Dolorosa, uh, Via Cruces, right, the way of the cross. Um, and we are going to explore these 14 stations together with you. In a nutshell, Via Dolorosa was uh, created like as, as, a, as a route. Uh, it took some, well, of course, years and years to create it, but it was uh, eventually uh, elaborated by Franciscan monks who for a long time have been the custodians of the holy sites in the Holy Land, I mean, Christian sites. But of course, there are so many other denominations in Christianity, and uh, it doesn't mean that, let's say, Protestants uh, do the same route, or they agree 100% about every, every station that it did happen there. Uh, it, it is true, it's not that easy, and we will see it also on the tour. And, uh, um, but even, even so, uh, even so, it's important to understand that Via Dolorosa is a, is a tradition, is a tradition, it shares the story uh, common to Christians all over the world, regardless of denominations, and it's totally fine that uh, even a, I would say, uh, opinionated um, Protestant would still go along the stations, would still go to see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, for example, because these locations are like important sites. And even though, uh, well, it's not exactly sure that a certain event happened exactly here, or there are several event, several places that claim to be the, the site of a certain episode, uh, even though it's sort of a classical route, it's the tradition mixed with uh, archaeology and architecture. So I will be taking you on a classical route, but of course I will be explaining you some of the things. And basically, so the 14 stations, it starts... Here with number one, um, I will be explaining as we go, and uh, it goes through uh, through the uh, Muslim quarter of Jerusalem, old city. Of course, it became Muslim much much later because Islam would be only born um, six centuries after uh, after Christianity, so in the in the seventh century. So, but we are now we are located in the Muslim quarter and the entire Via Dolorosa. It, um, it goes along the Muslim quarter of Jerusalem nowadays. And we're going to, to, to walk all the 14 stations. And uh, I'm not sure in which episode, but we definitely are going to spend an entire tour in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, of course, which is, uh, as I told you, regardless of denominations, uh, uh, it is considered an important Christian site, of course, where, well, where Jesus is believed to um, um, have been crucified, have been buried, and have uh, resurrected. Okay, so let's move on. Again, I'm not here preaching. I'm, I'm not doing this, right? So we are looking at it from uh, from different angles, uh, more like a tour guide and uh, some bits of history as well, of course. Um, why it's uh, called Via Crucis? Well, because because of the crucifixion and the crucifixion at times of the Ro well, well, of the Roman Empire, it was a very typical um, uh, way to um, to uh, a way of execution. And there are in in art you can find many horrible uh, paintings of crucifixions. It was a very very common way to uh, to punish the. Um, the criminals and uh, this is why there is nothing unusual in uh, crucifixion of Jesus in this regards it's not like he was given the most horrible type of execution of course not it's because this this is how common it was however uh even though we know that um 
crucifixion was very, very common in, uh, in the Roman times. Unfortunately, and surprisingly, there are very, very few, I would say, almost no archaeological findings, um, well, that would support this, uh, this fact of many, many, many crucifixions uh, throughout the Roman period. And uh, the only uh, archaeological finding that was made is, uh, is these uh, human remains. It's well, a, a section of a bone uh, in, a, um, in a leg, in a foot, of a person uh, with a nail in it. And it was a sensation. And it did puzzle archaeologists and historians why there are, well, then nothing has been found so far to support that fact uh, of mass crucifixions or mass executions. This is true. Uh, this is true that, um, well, surprisingly, and there is no really good explanation to it, but um, maybe one of the ideas is that uh, after uh, after crucifixion, that that person was buried, and then a year later, according to uh, also the, the way it was done in the uh, in 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 Judaism, because we are talking about uh, the Roman Empire in Judea, right in in the in the Holy Land, in the land of Israel. I'm not talking about the entire Roman Empire, and of course it differs. Um, but according to the Jewish tradition, so after uh, next year, uh, after the burial, the the bones, uh, the, the, the members of the family will come to the grave, will take the bones and put them in ossuaries, in, um, in small bone boxes. We'll be able to see some of them as the tour goes. So uh, this is why uh, maybe because of the reburial, uh, it's maybe the nails were taken out it's really hard to say but it is what it is what it is so this is what archaeology this is what we we have uh, as i told you in all the locations we are going to visit uh, we'll be seeing this emblem this is the emblem of the franciscan order uh, catholic order and uh, well, the cross and the two hands, one hand is the, this is the hand of Jesus with a stigma on it, right? And the second hand is the hand of the St. Francis of Assisi, who is believed to be, uh, well, to have founded this um, uh, order, monastic order that reports to the Catholic Church in the Rome, of course, to the Vatican. And uh, again, so we are following the classical like Catholic route, but it doesn't mean that uh, all the other denominations uh, totally disrespect and uh, disregard or ignore the, the way Via Dolorosa exists. But yes, this is tradition. And we'll be able to see where the tradition actually uh, corresponds and uh, well is supported by, uh, by archeology. span We're looking at a portrait of Herod the Great, Herod is the, uh, the client king of Judea. Uh, he reported to the Roman Empire. And uh, he is, well, of course, in Christianity, Herod is portrayed, is seen as a, a horrible, bloodthirsty person who tried to uh, also uh, get rid of Jesus because, well, because he was told uh, that there was born uh, the, the future messiah and he didn't want to lose his uh, to lose his power so he comm commissioned to kill uh, all the uh, all the babies up to 2 years of age so massacre of innocence this is what the name is con uh, connected with in christianity but in terms of history of the land of israel it's not only this but also herod the great is known as the big uh, you know, a creator because he he constructed so many uh, palaces for himself and not only, and he is also known as the uh, the one who reconstruct well re revamped enlarged the second temple in Jerusalem, and uh, also uh, in order to. Well, of course, the second temple does not exist anymore. It was uh, it was destroyed in the year 70 AD by the Romans as a result of the first Jewish revolt that started four years before that. So the second temple was destroyed. Um, but before that, so uh, it happened already after Herod's times, of course. But in times of Herod, uh, apart from... Uh, 
building, uh, re rebuilding, enlarging, revamping the second temple adjacent to the second temple. We are looking at the model that you can find now in Jerusalem Museum. Uh, there was built a fortress, an Antonia fortress. Uh, the idea behind the fortress was, well, first of all, uh, well, I, of course, um, since uh, uh, the under control, since Jerusalem and the land, well, the Holy Land was under control of uh, of the Romans, and the Romans were pagans, and the Jews were not, and uh, because of many clashes, and uh, of course, um, well, it's uh, well, it's not always it was uh, nice and peaceful, and we know the results. So definitely, there was a lot of um, dissatisfaction and arguments between the two peoples, between the two religions. And in order to make sure that the Jews would not revolt against the Romans, this fortress was constructed to just keep an eye on everything, especially to keep an eye on uh, on the Jews at times of big pilgrimage festivals. And uh, exactly uh, for Pesach, for uh, Pesach is one of the three pilgrimage festivals for Jews. Uh, also, Jesus came to Israel. He did uh, not to, uh, to Jerusalem. He lived in Nazareth. Uh, and uh, we know for sure that Jesus uh, visited Jerusalem many times. And uh, in the last week of his life, he also came to Jerusalem for Pesach. And uh, it is also believed that all the Roman, uh, let's say all Roman officials, uh, also were present in the Antonio Fortress because they wanted to keep an eye on how things were um, among the Jews. And um, this is why it is believed that Antonia Fortress, so this is the model, right? This is the model and uh, this is the Temple Mount. So the Antonia Fortress was built just next, like it shared the wall uh, with the Temple Mount. So it is believed to be the place since all the Roman officials were there in the Antonia Fortress, it is, to, it is believed to be the place where Jesus was uh, held captive, where Jesus uh, was on trial. And um, well, this is uh, this is the the belief, but uh, of course, it is not mentioned uh, in the Old Testament that yes, it was the Antonia Fortress. Uh, many things are not not explained to us, um, that is why some of the stations are well, arguably um, can be uh, can be called exactly the places where Jesus uh, Jesus's uh, way to death actually uh, went. So the first station uh, is, uh, I would say, even very easy to miss. It is, well, the place where Jesus was condemned to death. So it is believed since uh, it is the Antonia, Antonia for, is believed to be the Antonia Fortress. So, well, maybe it is uh, the territory of the Antonia Fortress. We will talk about the archaeology later on. Right now, on the spot where uh, where the, the alleged trial uh, is believed, where well, the trial is believed to have been, there is now the, the school for boys. Um, well, it's the, it's the Muslim quarter. So this is the, the school for, um, for Muslims, for the Arab population. And I actually know uh, one of my group mates, uh, his name is Majid. Uh, he actually started in, um, in the school. So this is a school for boys. And uh, he shared with me his memories that there was nothing, uh, uh, while he started there for actually several years, he didn't see anything. He, he doesn't remember anything um, in connection with, um, with Jesus, uh, with, uh, well, let's say, any of the topics related to, uh, to, to, to Via Dolorosa. The only thing that actually reminds everyone of the first station of the cross is... Uh, this digit over there, they, uh, all the stations are marked uh, with this uh, metal plaques, round me metal plaques with the Roman digits on them. It is possible to visit the, uh, the school, but um, not at the times of studies. Uh, every Friday, Franciscan monks, like after four, they start their procession from the first station to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and they are allowed to visit the school building, but this is after the classes. So who was, um, and I know that for many of you, this is like very common knowledge, you know what I'm sharing, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page. And uh, I want to make sure like we see, uh, we, we, 
like we have we are prepared and we know the, the we know the backstory so who is believed to have been there in the Antonia fortress to have been there in Jerusalem at the times of Pesach of course Pontius Pilate the field governor of the Roman province of Judea and uh, he uh, he reported to uh, of course Tiberius and um, uh, Pontius, Pil uh, Pontius Pilate is um, for a long time, it was believed that he probably didn't even exist, but up and until the, the period when in Caesarea there was found a stone with uh, with inscription on it uh, that this is the palace uh, of uh, Pontius Pilate. So Pontius Pilate did exist, uh, and. Uh, we also know that there was um, his uh, residence in Caesarea. And last year, I actually did two tours in Caesarea, and I might be doing it this year, but uh, we'll see. It depends on the season. It depends. Um, but of course, like in Caesarea, many, many important events for Christianity also happened, such as the first uh, non-Jew converted to Christianity, the first Roman was converted to Christianity there uh, in Caesarea by Peter. The Roman centurion uh, was converted. So there is connection with the Christianity in Caesarea. This is true. And not only that. And Caesarea was also um, built by Herod. So you see how all of this is connected. So it is believed. And of course, Pontius Pilate is uh, was the one who was who judged uh, uh, who judged Jesus, uh, together with Sanhedrin, right, with the council uh, of uh, the wise uh, of the wise men of, of the Jews. We will talk about the trial, uh, and of course, many of you know the story. Uh, I'm sure you can also quote the the New Testament, and I appreciate that. What is also important to understand that, however, the um, if you come to Jerusalem now, you will not see the Jerusalem that was built at times of Herod or at times of Pontius Pilate. Because uh, in the second century AD, Jerusalem uh, was um, rebuilt destroyed and rebuilt as a result of the second Jewish revolt. So the first one was in 66 AD, resulted in the destruction of the second temple. And the second revolt uh, in the 130s, the Bar Kokhba revolt, it resulted in the complete destruction of Jerusalem, the elimination even of the name of the city. It was turned into a pagan city called Aelia Capitalina. And on the Temple Mount, uh, of course, there was nothing left from the, uh, the from the second temple or the Jewish temple, but it was um, uh, there was a temple of Jupiter, which means that when, if you come to Jerusalem now, there is very very few locations, and we will we will see some of them that are actually the uh, contemporary to the times of Jesus. So this is why we will mention in Hadrian uh, more times during these tours. But it's important to uh, understand. And that the, the history behind it and the archaeology behind all of this. So what we see now, well, of course, this is the combination. So on the one hand, this is the Hadrian times, for example, the arches, but also the paving is from the, the plastic age, the 20th century. And uh, we need to, you know, you need to make sure uh, to, well, to be able to actually say the difference, tell the difference between the uh, different periods of time. But we will, we will see a lot of stones. We will see different kinds of stones. And uh, by the end, even of this tour, we will, we will have learned uh, how to differentiate between, for example, the old Roman um, uh, uh, flag stones or the the modern uh the, the modern uh the modern day stones uh so we are in the muslim quarter you see how narrow the walls how narrow the street is how thick the walls are uh this is all built of stone and uh, yes you will see for example also some arches uh you will see some constructions that definitely were changed and altered throughout history because this land changed hands so many times and let's say if up until the fourth century AD, this was uh, still, well, 
the Roman times, it was still the Roman period, the pagan period. Afterwards, it was the Byzantine period. And the Byzantines existed, uh, and the Byzantine Empire existed till mid seventh century. And then the Muslims came, it was the first Muslim period, and many things were destroyed, many things were changed. And this is why the, the, the Crusaders came, and the Crusaders were the first ones to, well, they came to oust the infidels. This is not my narrative, this is the narrative of the Crusaders. So they came to return the, uh, the holy sites to, uh, to Christians. So to oust the infidels, to oust the Muslims. And um, this is when the first monasteries would be built, the first churches would be built. They would be largely built on remains of Byzantine structures. We will see that. And uh, afterwards, after the Crusaders, uh, Crusader Kingdom lasted for a bit less than two centuries. And then uh, in the end of the 1200s, they were ousted and, well, significantly defeated by, by other Muslims. So the Mamluks coming from Egypt and then the Ottomans came in 1516. So you can imagine how the sites uh will have changed in the course of time and uh, well if you see an arch that uh, is built with bricks and the, the bricks don't coincide and they look to other bricks it's fine because this is also the testament of history okay so time for the second uh the second station and time flies so quickly oh my goodness right so the second station jesus is made to bear his cross church of the flagellation in fact there are um you see there's also number one right but in fact this is like two stations within one and since you're not, you were not able, and there was nothing for a long time to see in the first station. I know it's confusing. So the um, uh, the Franciscan monks built the church. Uh, uh, well, actually, they built uh, the church with the two chapels, where they both again um, uh, commemorated. Jesus, Jesus being condemned and Jesus uh, uh, being given his cross to carry it to Golgotha. So I know it's a little bit confusing, but you can understand that in the 19th century, Jerusalem had been, by, by that time, it had been heavily built and inhabited. And there were a lot of uh, uh, residential buildings in the Muslim quarter. So there was no way to build a church on that spot. That's why here uh, the Roman uh, Roman Catholics bought the purchased the land from the Ottomans and built uh, one church for two state. Well, and built one church made of two chapels uh, to uh, to mark the the two stations. So uh, the two the two churches are one on the same territory. Uh, it took me a while to actually prepare the video because. Once I was there, and one day the church was closed, and the other day it was open, but another chapel was closed. So yeah, it's always nice to check with the Christian Information Center in Jerusalem. You can go on their website. If let's say if you're planning your trip to to Jerusalem on your own, you don't buy tours, you don't hire a guide. This is where you can find all the reliable information regarding the working hours and the admissions of all the Christian sites of Jerusalem and actually not only. Since I'm a big fan of architecture, of course, we cannot but talk about architectural side of things. And most of the uh, holy sites as of the 19th and 20th century were built by this architect. He was the chief architect of the Holy Land, Antonio Barluzzi. The horrible thing is that he turned out to be a fascist. Later on, he died in 1960s, so yeah, they turned out to be um, a fascist. But, well, he had built all of these buildings uh, before this became known. And, um, well, he was a talented architect for sure. And uh, his heritage is absolutely impossible to underestimate. So welcome to the courtyard of the Church of Flagellation and Condemnation. Uh, of course, I cannot but quote some of the Old Testament. So in John uh, 19, verse uh, 13, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the stone pavement. Or in Hebrew, it called Gabbatha. 
So Jesus was held allegedly in Antonia Fortress, and then he was taken outside uh, to be judged. The place was called Gabatha. Gabatha uh, is a word from Aramaic, which actually means the stone pavement. In Greek, there is a word lithostrotos. We will come across, we will be coming across this, uh, this word a couple more times throughout the tours and probably today if we have enough time. And uh, so the thing is that when the Franciscans built the church, they were relying on the remains of some paving from the Roman times. And in fact, right now, underneath this church, uh, there is for sure found the Roman times paving. We will talk about it later. So yes, there definitely is archaeology behind, uh, behind this place. So this is uh, this is the first chapel. Um, you will uh, see that uh, it, the, normally the places apart from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre are rather small, uh, and uh, uh, you, I was quite lucky to film it either late in the evening or early in the morning before the big groups came. I was even lucky to see not that many people in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and in the morning. Uh, I really highly recommend to visit the, the holy sites like early in the mornings, especially the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. When I turn on the chat, please let me know if you have done uh, Via Dolorosa, if you have done a pilgrimage. I know some of you have. So we are in the very first church, in Church of the Flagellation. Uh, and um, well, the it looks modest on the one hand, on the other hand, take a look uh, at uh, at the at the marble. Take a look at the stained glass image, and uh, as we go, we will look up, and you will see that on the on the golden background there is uh, there was created a sort of um, um, a decoration that looks like the crown of thorns, and uh, well, of course, this is very symbolic. And the entire Via Dolorosa is about the suffering of Jesus. So you see this. Uh, uh, this is uh, the the perfect depiction of uh, the the crown of thorns, and these waves are believed to be the blood uh, the blood of Jesus uh, as he uh, as he wore uh, the crown of thorns. By the way, the tree from which the uh, the crown of thorns was made is uh, uh, well. The Latin name is like the Spina Christi, and it still grows all over the Holy Land. So sometimes you just you just find a shade in Jerusalem or elsewhere, and you and I look up and I see, oh my goodness, this is the tree. And when all of this, you know, comes in together, and you are in the Holy Land, and you are uh, somewhere in the old city, and you know that this place is of the first century, so this is. Uh, and you see the tree. So all these things, they they come natural, like they become so real. They feel so, so, so real, especially in Jerusalem. Like, of course, as, as true believers, as true Christians, of course, all of these things did happen and they, and they are so real. And this is true, of course. And you feel it every time you pray. Yes. Um, but when you're in Jerusalem, it's the, the whole new level of feelings. I am not a religious person, even though I am Christian. Uh, I'm Orthodox Christian uh, in Orthodox Christianity. Children are baptized at a very early, early age. And nobody really asks us if we want to be baptized or if you're okay being uh being placed in the uh, in the in the whole in the basin of water to get baptized because in orthodox christianity you are you really need to submerge in the water uh unlike in like in catholic tradition of baptizing so it's uh nobody really asks us but for some uh some of my friends uh, baptizing was a very traumatic experience because of that uh, but still, even if you're even if you're not a religious person, being there does make you tremble. Uh, also, this is the Jerusalem cross. Uh, the Franciscan monks, of course, are using this cross 
uh, a lot. Uh, it's one of the symbols of the, the uh, of the monastic order, and um, so this place directly reports to the to the to the Vatican, uh, because the Franciscans are uh, the custodians of uh, Terra Santa of the Holy Land. Also, now uh, on the territory of the courtyard, and very soon we will have a Q&A, uh, you can find the museum called Terra Sancta Museum. Well, the Holy Land, this is how it's translated from Latin. And uh, this is the museum where they have actually a fantastic um, like computer presentation, like high-end technologies that recreate the uh the re recreate the the um, the way the Via Dolorosa looked in the 19th century the way the Christian sites looked at times of the Crusaders and interesting findings in archaeology uh of uh, of the holy sites of um of Jerusalem before we visit one more chapel within uh within the station I would like to have uh, a Q&A so I turn the chat back on. So you are more than welcome to send in your questions. Uh, again, this tour is being recorded, so you will be able to see uh, the, the recording afterwards. I mean, upon uh, upon uh, request. And um, uh, I believe we're going to see a couple more stations today. So as you see, uh, I'm trying to provide, I would say, a bigger picture. I'm trying to provide also... Um, uh, all I see is the map with Roman numerals. Mm, which, which is the ro which Roman numerals are you talking about? Um, thinking you were uh, talking to different people, getting different shots of different times around the world. <laughs> More info in your entire life as a Catholic, Florence. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, uh, the first thing you, uh, so you, you cannot see anything else. You don't see the other video. So you got frozen maybe. Well, please feel free to contact me, dear, uh, after, the, after the tour and I will send you the recording. <laughs> Florence, you are thrilled. Thank you so much. Well, Linda, you see me, but you didn't see the, um, you didn't see the, uh, the, the part of the video. This is very, very weird. Well, feel free to contact me and I will send you the recording. No problem with that, sure. So it was frozen. I'm very, very sorry. Uh, hi, Mary, you're late. Well, contact me afterwards. I will send you the recording of this tour so you will catch up on everything you missed. Uh, uh, so Victoria, Anna, our children in your country merged during baptism. Uh, I live in the US and I'm a Roman Catholic. All my experience of baptism tradition is simply pouring the water on the forehead. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I mentioned. In Catholicism, during the baptizing, is just the small portions of the water are poured on the forehead of a baby. But in Orthodox Christianity, you are put in a basin and you are actually immersing in the water, like completely. Even for me, it was a bit traumatic experience. You know, um, I wasn't a good swimmer at that time. Even nowadays, I'm not. So I was I was more scared, you know. It was not awe, it was fear. Yes. So, of course, there are, there are so many differences. I mean, it's uh, about one of the same faith, but there are so many differences. And so like, um, yes. So th this is how it go, how it works in the uh, in Orthodox Christianity. Um, uh, Robert, great tour, new summit, I learned a lot so far. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, of course, so also having this opportunity to, to pre-record the tour, it gave me a chance to add a lot of, uh, a lot of additional footage, a lot of, a lot more content to back up the story, of course. Um, Hi, Rachel, or Rahel. Uh, Rachel, I walked with Lorossi in 1996 when I was 18. Amazing to see it again. Jerusalem is so beautiful and magical. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm not sure how much has changed since 1996. The Via Dolorosa, uh, well, hasn't changed at all. So the stations are the same. As for the old city, I also don't think it's changed. I actually will tell you some of the photos and you will see that for some places, things haven't changed in, in, two, in two centuries. Yes, so I will show you one photograph. <laughs> yes. 
So I think uh, time is really frozen there in uh, in Jerusalem. True, so true. I've always wanted to do the stations to the cross in the Holy Land. Thank you, Cindy. I know that for you, it's I know that for you, it is a it is a very special tour, and I'm so happy you've been able to join. I think of you very very often. Uh, Paul, you worked Via Dolorosa. Thank you so much for all the, yes, I also felt, uh, I did a general tours of Via Dolorosa outside of my studies, and uh, I, I saw pilgrimage groups, I didn't do pilgrimage, um, it would have been probably way too cynical, and um, it wouldn't, I wouldn't feel, I wouldn't have felt right doing pilgrimage, well, I'm not a religious person, um, I would I would have felt very really awkward. But when it's pilgrimage, of course, it's it's about faith. It's about the old. It's about the New Testament. It's about you know home going with the book, carrying the cross. Yes. So it's not about the I would say historical or archaeological side of things. It's more of a spiritual thing. General tours they provide history, but sometimes they're too dry, also and. Um, so I, I believe there should be some sort of a combination and I'm just happy I'm able to, to show, you know, a, a little bit of a bigger picture. And the, uh, Robin, yes, you, you can see this tour again. So uh, the recordings are always available for sponsors and also on demand. If, if you want to see this or that tool particular, you, you don't need to be my sponsor. You just need to let me know, uh, send me a, 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 a message. And uh, I will um, I will send you the the recording. So all the ways you can contact me uh, is uh, my this is my website, and there you can find the ways you can contact me. All my socials, my Instagram, my Facebook, and um, also my newsletter. You will need to see the beginning. Also, you have missed the beginning. Well, we we have only done like one station and a half. Yeah, but of course there is some introduction, which is quite really important because it does, you know, help you connect some dots before you go. Uh, good. I also froze a few times. Oh my goodness, I'm very very sorry. It's never happened before. Okay, well, feel free to contact me, and I will send you the recording. It didn't freeze for me. Well, technology. What can I say? Good. So I will be turning off the chat again and. Uh, there, there we go. Here we are. So we are still in the first and uh, sort of the uh, the the the, uh, the two locations of, of uh, the station of the cross. Uh, we have a map over there. We will return to it a little bit later. Uh, but first, I would like to take you to the Church of the Imposition of the Cross, so where Jesus is believed to have been given the cross to go and carry it to Golgotha. Uh, the location where we are now, just like I mentioned, the first churches appeared, were built here in the Byzantine times. Then with the, with the first Muslim period, they were used, for example, the first church was used as a residential building. And here Muslims built a mosque. When the crusaders came, of course, they, uh, well, they brought order to the place. They returned it uh, uh, to, uh, they, they returned it to, uh, uh, to to Christians, but what we see now, this is the 19th century architecture, because when the Mamluks came, uh, they destroyed the Christian sites, many of the Christian sites, and um, there was there was just ruins in the 19th century. Thanks also to uh, and um, uh, thanks to a rich uh, family from Bayern. The Duke Maximilian of Bayern, uh, the church was restored, and well, like, there was a like it was cleaned up, uh, and then later on, with the help of the the finance finan financial help from uh, from Germany, the place was rebuilt uh, under, the, of course, the uh, according to the project of uh, uh, Barluzzi, so that that architect. So you see here, Jesus uh, is just about to be given the cross that he would carry uh, uh, all the way to uh, his place of crucifixion. And it's also important to understand that uh, the executions 
were let's say were uh, only carried out outside of the city outside uh, for many reasons for Jews uh, well like a dead body is the most impure thing one can find that is why Jews try to uh, bury uh, their deceased uh, as quickly as possible like the next day and um, uh, with Jesus it was even uh, even quicker than that because the crucifixion happened just before Shabbat. Jesus was Jewish. So all these things, uh, they, uh, they they do matter and they uh, explain some of the things happening on those days. And it also explains some of the geography that we're going to see. Uh, also, uh, remember I mentioned uh, the um, archaeology underneath us. So we will be, uh, I will be able to take you to a location which is not connected to uh, Via Dolorosa. It's not, an, it's not the part of the Via Dolorosa, but the place, this is just located a minute away from here, has a lot um, and, uh, to, well, like a lot to share and also sheds light on on uh, on on like what was there at the times of Jesus, or actually what's the archaeology behind? Well, below the places, um, behind the places where we are now. Uh, so uh, this is the early 20th century map of the old city, uh, as according to the times contemporary to Jesus. So this is the Temple Mount. And this is believed to be the Antonia Fortress. And since all the uh, crucifixions, all the executions were held outside the city walls, so here it is believed to be the, the Golgotha, right? The Calvary. Golgotha means the skull. We will talk about it in one of the in one of the stations. Uh, the map is not 100% accurate, well, because of also new archaeological finds that have been made over the course of time, uh, but still, and so we are believed to be walking like along this path to here. Obviously, at that time, here on the spot, there is no Church of the Holy Sepulchre at that point, right? So we are still looking at, at the Jewish Jerusalem under control of the Romans. But it's still the map of, the, of Jerusalem, not Aelia Capitolina. And I should tell you that um, we've, we've had so many fantastic uh, tour guides and professors, you know, teaching us. And the first thing they tell everyone tells us when in Jerusalem, don't read the signs. Don't believe the information you uh, you can read on the street signs. Not the street names, but like the explications or like the explanations of this or that location because they, they have so many mistakes in them. <laughs> it, it is true. This is uh, also um, a good advice to those who are planning to visit Jerusalem on their own. Um, and uh, this area, well, we're in the Muslim quarter, so there are a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, Arabs. There are still residential areas, so many people are living here. Many Arabs are living here, but of course, everywhere you go, there will be the gift shop. There will be the the souvenir shops. And well, I mentioned that for some of the places, like things haven't changed in two centuries. So this is like eighteen. Uh, Allegedly, it's like 1860s. Uh, you see, you see a man wearing a tarbush. So the, the Ottoman times, the Ottoman Empire in the Holy Land lasted from 1516 to 1917, so 400 years. And uh, there, uh, at that time already, so this is the second half of the 19th century, for sure, because this is exactly when the Ottoman Empire. Thank you so much for the tippings. Thank you so much, dear. I really, really appreciate your help. Um, exactly uh, at that period of time in the second half of the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire actually opened its doors and turned its face to, to the Western world. It was losing its grip. It, 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 it became really weak by mid-19th century. And um, uh, 
in order to somehow stay afloat economically also, uh, they, they decided to allow the Christian pilgrimage, the Christian communities to purchase lands also at that time. Of course, it doesn't mean that before, b- before that time, uh, only the, the Turks lived in the, in the Holy Land. Actually, they did not. The Ottomans owned these lands, but throughout the Ottoman period for four centuries, uh, here on this land lived uh, Arabs, Jews, and even some Christians, but very, very little, very little. So um, we know of about like 30,000 Jews, maybe maximum, and uh, not not too many people at all. So I would say it was quite, um, apart from several cities, it was quite empty, you know, especially, well, of course, there's also like a the negative desert, so that the desert was very, very uh, poorly inhabited. So it was quite, it was not really crowded at all, but uh, almost immediately the um, uh, the Ottomans allowed pilgrimage and the purchase of the lands uh, by, the, by the Christian church. This is when the population of uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Land started growing at a frantic pace. This is true. And uh, of course, almost immediately, the first Christian sites will be opened. The pilgrimage means money, tourism. This is how tourism industry was born, exactly thanks to Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Of course, the souvenir shops will be open. And even nowadays, the same souvenir shops are located in the same spots. And you see it here. Because, because why not, right? I mean, it's fantastic. And uh, of course, you can find so many things in the shops. You can find uh, uh, all those religious attributes like crosses, you know, the crown of thorns, uh, together with uh, Persian rugs, for example. And it's it's common that throughout the, uh, throughout the Via Dolorosa, there is a church. Next to the church is a, a mosque. It's totally fine. It could be just in one of the same building, or it could just the doors could be just facing each other. So uh, good. We still have time for one more station. This is fantastic. Uh, so in the Gospel of John, um, nineteen verse five, Pontius Pilate says, "Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him." In so in legend he said, "Ecce homo." So this is the man, but you, I'm sure many of you know, but I need I need to say it again. So Pontius Pilate, when he was brought by Sanhedrin, when the Judas was brought to him by Sanhedrin, he didn't see guilt in Jesus. Um, but he, he, he like washed his hands, right? So he washed his hands and said, so if you believe that he, uh, that he deserves to be, uh, to be punished, so he gave, he gave Jesus, to Sanhedrin to decide. And uh, it is believed that these words were said, so it was outside, right? So it was outside on the place called Gabatha, right? Where the, where the trial take place, took place. So it is, it is believed to be, to be there. And uh, the place where we are now is called also a Cahomo. The, uh, the arch that we saw above the street is called Arch del Eke Homo. So the, this is the man. So we are quoting Pontius Pilate. And uh, um, the footage that I that I uh, source for all my tours, like it's the open sources. So you can find actually many, um, many drawings, many, many plans for how uh, Jerusalem looked at times of uh, Herod and at times of Hadrian, right, in the pagan times. But what is uh, what is important for us that, um, and by the way, this is how it looked in the 19th century. So the first excavations and the first constructions were actually held in the 19th century. And exactly then when the churches were, were built, like the Church of Flagellation and Condemnation built in the 19th century. So this is when they found the, the Gabatha stones, right? Or the Lithostrotus, the, the stone paving from the Roman times. However, And I'm not sure if it is mentioned on pilgrimage tours, but it's important to understand that we are looking at not the Herod Times architecture, but we're looking at 
the uh, by the Hadra times architecture of the um, of the um, of the pagan times. Why? Because this is believed to be the Hadrian triumphal arch built here to uh, well to mark the entrance to the former Temple Mount because the Temple Mount is just well sort of around the corner but we cannot visit it because you're not if you're not muslim you're not allowed to use the gates uh uh for muslims the the, the temple mount is uh, uh it's um it belongs to muslims so and there is also a lot of residential buildings so there is now no way you can visit like this you know just from the Dolorosa, you cannot visit the the temple mount um but this is believed to be the pagan times, Hadrian times arch. Uh, that was uh, one of the ways to visit the Jupiter temple on the former temple mount in the Aile Capitolina. Uh, and it's, and uh, these arches, they actually exist now, uh, nowadays. So why is it called Ecohomo? It, wasn't, it was not named like this by Hadrian. But when the churches were built in the 19th century, they so and they found those paving stones, they found the pavement that Gabbatha, again, it's Aramaic word for lethal strutters, it's a Greek word for the stone paving, stone pavement. So they believe, that, oh, this is the Antonia fortress place where Jesus was trialed and then condemned. And so, and they named it Ekahomo. So Ekahomo is the name um, given. Well, mistakenly, uh, to the the pagan site, it's not a disgrace. It's because this also became known quite recently. Um, uh, but Ekahomo is a is of course a a very important uh, quotation. It's a very important like a notion of Christianity. And of course, there are so many uh, paintings. And since I'm so much into art, I wanted to be able to show you some uh, some art uh, related to the topic. So this, for example, I've never seen by the way this painting by Antonio Cesare. So this is Jesus on trial, and Pontius Pilate says "Ecce homo." So and to the, so the Sanhedrin is uh, waiting there to um, get done with um, with Jesus. So and how all of this many many centuries many different well like uh, this all comes in together in one and the same place and even if the the, the new findings new archaeology says that maybe it's not exactly that it well it still feels very special there and like even for me another religious person. The energy of this place is real. It is real. Or I like this by Mihai Munkachi, uh, Christ Before Pilate. I also like this. And you see, of course, how different artists from different periods of time would portray uh, both Jesus and the Romans and the Jews and Pontius Pilate. I mean, it's a very interesting way. And you still see some arches, right? So some arches, the Ecohomo arch was even known at times of uh, uh, of crusaders. So this knowledge became known uh, starting from the 11th century, 12th century, and uh, it, it was known throughout the, the uh, throughout the Christian world. And uh, you see that artists of different periods of time they actually uh, carry on uh, depicting. Uh, uh, all these um, elements. So uh, in Ekahoma now, um, this arch, so the part of it you can see in the street, but the two more sections are within the buildings. One of the one of the section, one of the three, you saw it as three, three arches in one. So one of the arches is part of a church and the monastery of Sisters of Zion. Please meet Marie Alphonse Redisbon, a French atheist Jew of the 19th century who converted to Christianity, came to the Holy Land, and establish the small church and a small orphanage for girls. And later on, it uh, with time, with financial help of Catholic Church, it became a big monastery that still exists nowadays. I mean, you see, an atheist Jew converted to Christianity, 
came to the Holy Land, left everything behind and established the monastery that still stands on the same place. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, <laughs> I've come, but yeah, obviously. And um, the last thing we're going to see, we're going to visit uh, this uh, chapel, the Eka Homo. However, it is not part of the Via Dolorosa, but there is archaeology that is so essential for Via Dolorosa. And there, the possible explanation is that uh, we will see that probably, uh, so the, the paving found underneath the Eka Homo and underneath the churches of flagellation and condemnation, it's not from the Herodian time, which means the Jesus times, but it's from the times of pagan Jerusalem. But it is also possible that the uh, the, the bricks, the, the stones from Antonia Fortress, uh, since Antonia Fortress was destroyed as well, would be like the construction materials would be reused again. So they will be the secondary use and they will be brought here. So it's highly possible that those are the same pavement um, that Jesus might have walked on as well. So we are now inside the church and Actually, so this is the fully operating monastery. So you, uh, you are allowed to visit the church only at a certain times and a certain days. But this is the third arch. So this is one of the three arches of the Ekahomo Arch, the Hadrian Times Triumphal Gates. And uh, here is the beginning. Uh, it's, you, you, can, you can hardly see it, but trust me, here is the beginning of the main arch, which you see from the outside. And another section of the arch is in the mosque, because just uh, opposite the door of Sisters of Zion uh, Monastery, there is a mosque. That's how it works here. That's how it works in Jerusalem. Fantastic. So we, we, we could only visit it uh, just behind this uh, transparent screen, but I do believe that it's it's you, you can still see everything. And uh, even though it is not part of Vio Dolorosa, but it is so connected with it. So I believe it's, uh, it's just fine, even though uh, it doesn't have like a direct connection with it. And uh, there you go, two storerooms or cisterns originally hewn in the rock as burial caves. So next time, when uh, I will be, I'll stop sharing the screen now and turn the chat back on. So next time we will be able to go underground, actually a couple of dozen meters underground to see the archeology span below the place. We will see the bedrock. The bedrock, it means it's always been here, even 2,000, even three, 5,000 years ago. We will see some archaeological finds, some of them like 5,000 years ago. We will be able to see the cisterns that were there at times, at the Herodian times. We will be able to see the paving that is sort of dubious, either it's Hadrian or Herodian times, which means it's either Jesus or right after Jesus times. So this, we, we will do it uh, exactly the, um, uh, I, will, I will do it this way. So for those of you who joined later, I also know that, I, I, I know that some of you had this presentation frozen for a while. So please feel free to contact me. Uh, and I will send you the recording because, of course, I, I cannot just uh, leave it like this. And you have taken me to a place I wish I could visit. Victoria, thank you so much. I'm so happy that you have learned something new. Again, I realize that many of you devoted Christians know so many things way better than I do. It's true, but the idea behind Dio Dolorosa and taking you on this tour is to give you a bigger picture and, uh, well, show you some archaeology, show you some facts, show you some history. And I do believe that combining both spiritual side of things and like archaeological, architectural, historical side of things, well, this creates Dio Dolorosa very, very special. Again, regardless of the religion that you believe you belong. This has been one of the most amazing tours. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you so much. Uh, Hester, 
thank you. Oh, you actually were here in 2022. Wow. I'm uh, happy you learned something. Thank you. Thank you. It means so much to me. You have no idea. Jerusalem is such a challenge for every guide, for a for beginner guide, but even for experienced guide, Jerusalem is, is a challenge. And you have no idea how I've I, how worried I am about this tour, how nervous I was and how many hours I spent for this research. Thank you. It, it means so much to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, thank you. I'm happy you found it moving. Uh, I would like just once again to uh, send you the links on how you can book part two. So Vio Dolorosa part two uh, is going to take place next Saturday. Uh, and also here are the links on how you can tip me for the tour. I really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Uh, Cindy, other than being there in person, there is no way better than do it with you, Cindy. Of course, I understand doing it in person is, yes, it is a very special thing. And uh, yeah, I, I saw many people crying. I saw many Christian pilgrims carrying the crosses and crying, weeping, you know, just feeling it, you know, living through uh, the sufferings of Jesus. And I totally, and, and, and I feel these emotions, they're very strong, they're genuine. So even if it's partly tradition and archaeology is not 100% clear here, it's still very moving. It's still a very, very special place, very, very spiritual place. I know I will never get there in person. For me, this is the next best way. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Vicky. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your tips. Thank you for all the support. Uh, you can choose either PayPal or buy me a coffee, whichever is convenient for you. Um, and uh, also, um, Again, just like I told you, the recording, uh, the recordings of all the previous tours are available for sponsors on a secret link, the secret playlist on YouTube. I share the link uh, also if you're interested to become uh, my sponsor. I hate the word sponsor, supporter, but this is the term used by Hago, so I use the old term. And feel free to contact me if you only want to catch up with this tour. I will send you the recording. Thank you so much. I'm very sorry for the glitches. This technology, it happens sometimes. It's never happened before, so I hope there won't be any more freezing. Uh, in uh, about 30 minutes from now, I am more than excited to meet you in St. Petersburg for a very special tour, White Nights boat trip. So exactly now, St. Petersburg is experiencing this very special natural phenomenon of White Nights. So it almost doesn't get dark at night and doing a river cruise to see bridges opening in front of you. It is a very special, very, very special phenomenon and a very special feeling. And after Via de la Rosa, when I feel so elevated, when I feel so spiritualized, it's probably going to be even more, um, even more fantastic experience. So uh, I can't wait to see you uh, on that tour as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robert. The best part of history is knowing how one thing led to the next. Yes, exactly. How things are connected. This is true. Thank you so much, Florence. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Thank you for all the support. And uh, see you in 30 minutes from now or see you in Jerusalem next weekend. Bye-bye, everyone.